that part, we are really the link between the patient and the radiologist. So the more information we can get about the patient, uh, ultimately, you know, why do we do what we do? Ultimately, is the care of the patient. And so it really comes down to us. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, so when we find discrepancies, do we go to the radiologist? Oh yeah, you, you, know, you go back. You go back. It depends. Uh, for example, in the case where the radiologist is there, you go and tell the radiologist, "Look, this is what the patient is telling me. <coughs> um, the patient is highly allergic to iron. What do you want to do?" And it is, it is his call. If a radiologist is not available, then you go back and talk to uh, the other physician, mm -hmm. and it's, it's up to them to decide what to do. A lot of times, once again, it's unfortunate, but uh, it happens. You go back and tell them, you know, the patient is highly allergic to iodine, and so, so. Well, yeah. they might they may have an allergic reaction that would be like. Well, but they, they don't know. My, my point is that they don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll expect the doctor to know that, right? But a lot of times they don't. Mm -hmm. or, or, or a lot of times they don't. Let me see. I think it's one third, is it one third or one fourth? I can't remember the specific number. But so, kind of help quote me on this. About one third of all induced kidney failures in this country are due to contraindicated reactions. Uh, and, and listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying all kidney failures. I'm saying induced kidney failures, provoke kidney failures. Are due to uh, contraindicated reactions. So when you talk to, and I'm serious, I, I, you know, and I'm not trying to put them down. I'm not trying to say they don't know what they're. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that, you know, medicine has become so specialized that a lot of times you just concentrate on your area, and that's what doctors do a lot of times. They concentrate on their area, and they don't. A lot of times they don't know what's going on outside but many of them they don't know that uh that contrast media and i'm talking iv contrast media mm -hmm. that's not so much oral contrast media but iv contrast media is very is very harsh on your kidneys very harsh on your kidneys okay and for example a patient that had had say a contrast media two days before typically it is not recommended to give them again because the kidneys go, I mean, you're putting them under a lot of work. It's harsh. Gadolinium, which is another country, it's an MRI country, it's even harsher on your kidneys. And so, but a lot of times doctors don't know that. You know, they say, well, a patient is reactive. Okay, but, you know, given benefit or whatnot. The, the other component, for example, it is not recommended to give contrast media to someone who's a diabetic taking metformin because metformin is already putting your kidneys under a lot of pressure. And many times they don't know. And so you have to be vigilant. Okay? And, and you know, I hope you don't think that way. And I, I, I don't think you do. Uh, that is somebody, somebody else's responsibility. I'm responsible for the patient. I mean, that's how I feel. Uh, and, and whatever I, I need to do, whatever I need to find out, I will do it. I, I can do it. Hmm. So, I sat in CT a little bit yesterday because we were very slow. So, they always check diabetes and creatinine levels. Yes. So, and there's a few other things that they need to check creatinine levels, and that's kidney function. Uh, uh, diabetes, uh, someone taking uh, anti-inflammatory medications like uh, ibuprofen, for example, on a regular basis. If you take too many, uh, uh, what was the other one? There's a few, but uh, no, 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 that, that was fine. Uh, but. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications in general, they are not good for your kidneys. They, are, they, they make your kidneys work harder. And so, and on top of it, you're giving metformin. 
someone who's uh, who has asthma, for example, you don't you know you have to think about before giving them contract media because you can induce an asthma attack. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, let, oh, I'm you, sorry. You basically answered it. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. Okay, let you finish. Yes, one yes. thing that kind of scares me is that one of the patient doesn't have like a history of how they react to conscious media and uh, you don't know that until well, it until happens, it happens. Right? Yeah. and what happens if you if, if like so if I <laughs> do that and, I, and do that and then the person says oh I don't have any major reaction because I never and or they're saying I'm not quite sure because this is the first time they're having I guess this uh, iodine <laughs> Okay. Uh, it, it's then that's really all you can do is just I mean if you don't know and, and that's the one thing with contrast media reactions that you don't know when someone can react it's not like a, say a, an anaphylactic reaction someone who's uh, for example uh, allergic to bee stings right you know that you cannot be close to bee stings because you're going to react that typically doesn't happen with contrast media. I say typically because he cools. See, this is one, thing, and we'll study this next year, but um, in 440. Uh, but contrast media can mimic, if you're going to write this down, <laughs> write it like this, can mimic an anaphylactic reaction. But it's really not an anaphylactic reaction. Because I have seen patients that have had multiple contrast media injections, they never react. Never. All of a sudden, boom, they react. An anaphylactic reaction is not like that. You are reactive, you're awesome. gonna be reactive for the rest of your life. You don't change, okay? Someone who's allergic to uh, peanuts, for example. If you're allergic to peanuts, you're, you don't, you know, sorry if you're allergic to peanut but sorry to tell you, but you're never gonna go over that. I mean, they can give you, they can kind of ease on the uh, on the reactions. They can give you injections and kind of kind of ease you. But you're always gonna be reacting. It's just the way it is. But with contrast media, it's not like that. Or you could be, you could have reacted once before. You might not react the next time. Mm. Most likely, you will, but. You might not. That's one of those things. So it's, it's not really an anaphylactic reaction. Karen? So how would you uh, kind of like avoid getting sued by a fa uh, fa by the family of the patient if they, <laughs> well, say, if they say, oh, you didn't? No. Uh, what you do is, is, you know, you're also going to be trained what to do in a case like that. So okay. one thing is every location where you have, uh, where you're doing contrast knee injections, uh, you're going to have uh, an emergency kit just for that. Benadryl and stuff like that is what you will find. And then you call the emergency team. Okay. Yeah, that's that's all you can do. And typically, once you give the patient Benadryl, they get better. But, you know, if that's why you have not signed a consent form and letting them know that a possible, a possibility out of all of this is death. Is ultimately it's the patient's choice. The patient doesn't want to have contrast media injection, they don't have it. But you're giving them the choice. Yes? Okay. Is it protocol for us to always ask the patients if their appendix have been removed? It should be. If you're having an, an abdominal study with contrast media, yes, it should be. All right, let's, let's move on. All right, did I answer your question? <laughs> okay. All right, so radiographic procedures, so esophagram, okay. Uh, some of the responsibilities that you uh, take care of, you have to have your room prepared, okay. Prepare the contrast media, and in what order, it doesn't matter. Uh, have a clinical history. Once again, remember what I had said before. Really, you become the ears of the radiologist. They are not there with the patients. And even when they come in, they'll say, they're, hi, good morning. And they get to whatever they need to do. Uh, and so you need to get a history. A lot of times, doctors will send patients, and all you have in the history is pain. Oh, yeah. That's not saying anything. 
pain. You can have pain for many reasons, okay? I mean, they need to be more specific. They can say pain for the last two weeks, pain in the right lower quadrant, pain in the upper left upper quadrant. You know, they need to be more specific. You know, and then they can say possible colitis, possible appendicitis, or possible something. But they need to give more than just pain. Okay. And so that's what, you know, you need to get more out of the patient. Okay. Uh, you can ask them, you know, are, are you bleeding? Uh, does this happen when you eat? Or does it happen when you're asleep? Does it happen when you're standing up? Does it happen when you're laying down? I mean, that kind of information it is your responsibility to get, okay? And write it down and provide it for the radiologist, okay? It helps them make the correct diagnosis. Ultimately, once again, ultimately, we work for the patients, right? That's what we get involved in a business like this, is to help patients. And so you do, you know, you take the extra, extra step uh, to make sure that you get the right history. If you think, let me put it this way, and I'm, I just want to be frank with you and honest. If you think you're in this business just to do x-rays, this is the wrong business for you. Really, if you think you're just going to be doing taking pictures and that's it, forget about it. This is, you know, then become a photographer. I I'm serious. Or work for Google and take pictures of houses and whatnot. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really more than that. When you work in healthcare, right, or if you think you're gonna make a lot of money, you, this is the wrong business for you. It's not. There, there, there's other areas where you can make more money. So, uh, and so we take the extra, the extra step, whatever we need to do to help patients. We don't even work for doctors. I never worked for a doctor in my life. I, for the most part, I don't like their personality. I wouldn't work for a doctor. I work for patients. Uh, so, once again, ultimately, it, that's what we're trying to do. So we take the extra step uh, to help the diagnosis of the patients. So I will do my part, and the doctor will hopefully will do his part, and everybody will do his part or their part. So get the history, explain the procedure. <coughs> Uh, this is important too, uh, explaining the procedure. A lot of times doctors and PAs and whoever is sending the patient, they don't explain the procedures to the patient. A lot of times they don't know. And in many cases, they don't, they, ha they don't have an understanding. Patients will come in, and I told you this before, patients will come in for, say, an esophagram. And they say, oh, they are just gonna do an x-ray of you. <laughs> they never told them that they're gonna drink barium and that it doesn't taste very good. Okay, and then they have to be fasting for the previous eight hours. They don't tell them that kind of stuff. So, uh, so all right. Introduce and assist the fluoroscopist. Obviously, introduce yourself. It's always right. Okay, and then assist the patient in any way you can. As office, okay, projections we're gonna do, the AP and the lateral, and typically an RAO. Sometimes you will do maybe one or two, sometimes you will do all three, depends on your facility, all right? Uh, once again, and I've mentioned this before, uh, the class of 2014, I think, they prepared this, okay? Everybody that went through, rotated through the different hospitals, they brought their protocols. So, here, here it is, if you don't know, if you haven't, look at the protocols is, is available for you take a look and see what they do the distance for all these projections are going to be at 40. Okay. shielding yes you can provide gonadal shielding you cannot provide any other type of shield don't you know no thyroid shield no that's not possible uh abdominal shield, that's not possible because you're going to be seeing the stomach it's even though it's called an esophagram Okay. You're gonna see from the mouth all the way down into the stomach. Okay, and so no shielding, you know, above the iliac crest. Okay, you you need to have you can only provide gonadal shielding. Collimation, yes. You will need to collimate side to side. I will not recommend, especially not on adults, to collimate up and down. Do not collimate 
the top, don't make the bottom. Open it up all the way, okay? Because once again, you need to include, you must include the mouth and you must include the stomach. Not the entire stomach, but you need to include the entrance of the esophagus into the stomach. Okay. All right, so uh, the collimation side to side, yes. Uh, Sisofilm, you know, if you're using CR, I will use a 14 by 17. If you're using DR, well, use the whole field and then collimate side to side. Now, careful though, because sometimes you have patients because of pathologies or because of just the anatomy they have, sometimes the, the esophagus can really curve. Okay, and so make sure that you include the entire esophagus. Uh, positioning. Uh, so let's start with the area. Okay. Position the patient. Uh, in the REO position, you all know what the REO is, right? Yeah? Okay. So, with the mid sagittal plane forming an angle 35 to 40 degrees from the table, okay? Not from the lateral, but from the table. Well, if you're at 45, then you're kind of midway in between. But uh, it's from the table, 35 to 40 degrees. Okay. Uh, so far, so good? Sometimes the REO can be done prone, but it can also be done upright. So it depends on the radiologist and you're thinking, really prone? Yeah, and the patient will be drinking while he is laying down. Okay. So center the elevated side to the, to the grid through the plane, approximately two inches lateral to the mid sagittal plane. So you go back to the mid sagittal plane, you observe it, and then from there, you're going to go two inches lateral to that side. Okay? Does it make sense? I'll, I'll show you pictures, you'll see. All right, place uh, the right arm, okay? Uh, place the right arm. The right arm is going to go down by the hip, add that to the hip. Hip, here, right here. Right arm to the hip. Okay, so the right arm will go down, the left arm will go, you flex the elbow and the uh, left arm will come up to the head. Because you're gonna use that hand, that left hand, so the patient can hold the cup and drink. Okay, uh, okay. and provide a pillow, hopefully a high pillow so they can drink. It's easier to drink that way. And make sure the knee is placed, uh, if you flex the knee for support, so the patient will end up like this, like that, like this, okay. So far so good? Mm -hmm. Good. The central ray, the central ray is perpendicular to the midpoint of the image receptor, approximately at the level of T5, T6, okay? How do we find T5, T6? Uh, one inch below the sternal angle. I will find T7 because I'm, the patient is on a prone, right? Mm -hmm. You know how to find T7. Chest x-ray, central ray, mm -hmm. all right? Then go up an inch or so, okay? Inch and a half, okay. depending on the patient's size. The structures that are going to be shown, you will see the esophagus, okay? Between the heart and the ventricular colon. Sometimes the heart, especially if the heart is enlarged, can push the esophagus to the side. So take that into account. Also, uh, uh, when when the doctor is doing their pleuroscope, uh, you will see how the uh, esophagus is located. Okay. One thing I didn't explain, before we get to, these are called overheads. These are pictures that the x-ray technology will do. Before you get to these pictures, typically what happens in a fluoroscopy study is the radiologist will come in and they will give the patient a barrier, and they will see the, the uh, esophagus in this case, they will see it while the patient is swallowing. When they are done with their part, with the uh, fluoroscopy part, then you take over and do the overheads. Does okay. that make sense? Uh -huh. How many of you have not seen any fluoro studies? Any GI studies? You guys haven't seen it yet. Yeah, it's a, yeah you guys too sweet parents may don't do that. Uh, everybody else has? Even those of the clinics? Well, we don't have them. That's what I'm saying. Who has not seen it? 
There we go. GI it's quite a few. <laughs> uh, or any, any, any GI case. Um, All right, so it's quite a few of you. I knew that. Okay. Evaluation criteria. So then I can emphasize more on the pictures because then the great majority has an idea what, what's going on, but uh, you might not. You might not have an idea. Uh, so evaluation criteria, no rotation of the patient. The esophagus from the lower part of the neck to his entrance into the stomach. Uh, not only to the lower part of the neck, uh, you need to include more. You need to see, you need to see the oropharynx. Okay, most doctors like to see that. A lot of times they will even bring the fluoroscope all the way up, all the way up to the head, and they see them swallow from the mouth. Okay, they see the barium, the mouth full of barium. We'll take a shot to the mouthful of barium and then they, they have them swallowed. Okay. All right, so take a look. So the patient is RAO, the right arm down by the hip, left elbow is flex, left knee is flex. Okay, patient is rotated about 35 to 40 degrees. Yeah. Uh, and patient holds the uh, top of barium. And when you have, you center everything. Okay, and you get the fluoroscope out, get it out, and then you bring your x-ray tube. And then you move behind, once you're all set, you move behind the panel and you ask the patient to drink. Okay, don't do it at the first, uh, the first swallow. Just go, you know, drink, 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 drink. Give them time for them to swallow, have the esophagus filled with contrast. If the esophagus is not filled with contrast, the picture needs to be repeated. Okay, so the esophagus, the entire esophagus from the mouth all the way to the stomach has to be full. Okay, so you can swallow, drink, 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 drink. And, and you, you're watching them, right? You're watching them because a lot of times you're gonna go drink, 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 and they're going, ooh. No, it, it's, okay, make sure the patient is drinking. And then when you think it's enough time, and you take a picture, okay? Make sense? Yeah. Um, to get them at that angle, are they propped up on one of those 45 degree pillows? You hold, uh, it's really not necessary. Yeah, especially not with the knee and the elbow flex, but you could give them a, 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 a sponge. I don't like to, to use the sponges when I'm using barium because if barium gets into the sponge, is ruined. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna be able to use that sponge anymore because you cannot get the barium out. And it will show up on any subsequent pictures you do. How, how, many, how often is it that they'll want the still radiographs after they've done the fluoro? Because I, I see them do this do procedure this, sometimes, and, and but they, 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 there's no x-rays being done after Yeah, it depends on the radiologist. It really depends on them. Uh, a lot of times, you know, they have enough with digital systems, they have good enough pictures that they don't want anymore. Uh -huh. A lot of times they do. Yeah. And then sometimes it's speech therapists who are doing this? No, the speech, is no, the speech there is a different procedure. Okay. Yeah, that's called a, a cookie swallow. Oh, cookie, yeah. yeah and that's and the, the purpose of that study is to see if when you have a bowl of food, depending on the consistency of the food, where is it going? Is it going to the esophagus or is it going to the uh, trachea. That's what they're doing. Especially they do it with patients that have had a stroke. They want to know because when you have a stroke, common, commonly what happens is you lose the ability to swallow. Okay. And you can swallow, but you don't know where your, you don't know where it's going, where the food is going. It's going to the esophagus or the trachea. And, okay. and that is, so it's a little different. Right. Yeah, they don't do this, 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 this part, they don't do it. We okay, so now take a look at it from here. All right, central ray about the level of T5, T7 from the mid sagittal <coughs> plane. You're gonna move uh, to the left, okay, to the upper part. Okay, make sense? A good hint for you is what I found is that if on your picture you include the spine, you will always have the esophagus. Don't include the entire spine, but make sure you get at least the border of the spine. You're gonna get the esophagus. Because the esophagus, remember, runs all along the spine. All along the spine. And so, include a little bit of the spine, you're gonna be fine. 
typically from here, from the mid part of the spine, you go about an inch, an inch and a half, depending on the patient. Some patients, it might go two inches. Go to the side, and the cephalus will come and curve just as the spine is curving. Okay. And the top of the collimation is? Uh, the top of the collimation here, all the way up to here. Here. So, top of the top. ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you want to see them from the very beginning. All right, 35 to 40 degree obliquity. Uh, and this is what it should look like. Uh, and, and even more, I mean, most doctors, depends on your doctor. Like I said before, probably 90% of all the uh, radiologists that I have worked with, they wanna see that. They wanna see all the way up here, okay? They wanna see the neck, okay? As the patient calls it. Take a look. Contrast media is, is filling the, the the esophagus. You can see the spine here. So the uh, esophagus will follow the contours of the spine until the very end just kind of deviates. Make sense? If there were portions of the esophagus that are not filled, we have to do it again. Okay. All right, lateral results. Okay. The patient will also go recumbent. <coughs> and when I say recumbent, they can also go erect. Okay. And the same with the REO. Typically, the REO is done recumbent, but it could be done. It could be done erect. It doesn't matter. I mean, as an X-ray tech, it doesn't matter to you. It's easier on the patient if you do them erect. It's difficult to drink while you're laying down. Try it. <laughs> well, maybe not. You might. You might suffocate yourself. You might end up in the emergency room. <laughs> so, uh, all right. Decision the patient recumbent or erect. Uh, align the mid-coronal plane to the midline of the image receptor. So, once again, mid-coronal plane, okay, we're gonna align it to the midline of the image receptor, okay? Careful when you have someone that is overweight, okay? Someone with a big belly, just go to the mid-coronal plane, okay? Look at the mid-coronal plane. Forget about how the belly is looking and how far out it is. Go back to the mid-coronal plane because when someone is overweight, and someone has to be really, really overweight for the stomach to start pushing out, typically it doesn't happen. All of that is fat. It's a layer of fat. It's not, it's not really the, the organs pushing out. The organs are staying there. Okay. You'll notice that when you do CT, someone that is overweight, you know, they have little bodies little tubes in the middle, and then all of this layer of fat around it. So, so keep that in mind. So when I say mid-coronal plane, it's stick to the mid-coronal plane. Uh, place the arms forward, okay? Place the top of the image receptor about two inches above the level of the shoulders. Okay, almost like if you were doing a chest x-ray, right? Level of the shoulders, two inches above, there's where you place. And that will typically bring you up to the mouth. Okay, so about this level, and then you go down from there. Okay. Done? All right, central ray. Central ray is perpendicular to the image receptor. <coughs> and once again, to the level of T5, T6. All right, and the structures that are going to be shown, the entire esophagus, and it will be found, you will see it, that it will be between the heart and the spinal and the uh, vertebral column. Right in between the two, okay? And remember when I was showing you those cross-section pictures before when we started this section, get a relationship of where the esophagus is in relation to the trachea. Remember I told you that? Mm -hmm. And the spine, okay? So it's important, especially with this projection because now you need to have a sense of where the esophagus is found. You know, the mid-coronal plane is just a guideline, but you will need to make adjustments from there. Okay, evaluation criteria, patient, 
arm should not be interfering with the uh, proximal esophagus. So that's why you bring them forward. You don't want to have them down. Bring them forward. You're still going to have less density because of the shoulder's thickness, right? On your image, it's going to look that portion. It's going to look lighter because you have more to penetrate. Uh, but it should not interfere. You should still should be able to see the esophagus. Uh, patient's arm are interfering with the proximal esophagus. The true lateral is indicated by direct superimposition of the posterior ribs. Just like, didn't we use this criteria for the lateral chest x-ray? Yes. Okay, you forgot? Yes. All right, the posterior ribs are gonna be superimposed. Okay, and then the esto entire esophagus once again, has to be filled with barium. Pretty easy, huh? All right, take a look. Yeah, these are not difficult projections. So, once again, the patient is in the lateral, okay? Provide a left shield, bring the arms forward, okay? Make sure the patient is not rotated, so go to the top of the uh, patient here, go to the top of the x-ray table, look and make sure the patient is not rotated, make sure the patient is straight, not at an angle, on the table, okay, and then go to the mid coronal plane, okay, and then level of T5, and the uh, image receptor should be about two inches above the shoulder, which is at the level of the mouth. So you can see the mouth full, you can see the entire esophagus, and the esophagus is gonna go like this. Okay. What are the markers? Huh? What are the markers? Uh, where, where should we place the markers? Well, there's two markers there. Is one of them saying it's like a contrast material or is, do we have to do something like that? Or is it uh, what markers? Oh, oh, no, this is a flasher. This That's is a flasher. Uh, this is okay. a flasher. This is the marker. And I will not, good, I'm glad you brought this up. I will not put the marker here. It's not going to show up because you're collimating, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I will do, I will put the marker here in the middle. Okay, I will put it in the middle and a little more if this is a 14 by 17, in a little more. Why? Because look at the uh, curvature of the esophagus. See that? And this is more of an, this is not really normal. I mean, this is, take a look, this patient is hypotic. This is an older patient, barrel chested. So it's going like that. Most patients are gonna go probably like this, but it's still you have a curvature. Remember I was describing that? I was saying there is a curvature. Did I say it's gonna go like this? Okay, it's almost a, a C. That you're making so if you put your marker here that's fine okay it's not going to interfere with the radiograph you're saying well it's going to be over the heart well we're not looking at the heart we're looking at the esophagus okay that is going to create this and, and you need to see more here okay but these are the best examples i have so entire almost entire esophagus in this case and check with the radiologist. A lot of times the radiologists already in their pictures, in their fluoroscope pictures, they already have enough pictures of the uh, uh, neck area. They don't need them, so check with them. Okay. Sorry, so where would you put the marker? I will put the marker here. Okay. So on so the IR? On the IR, I will yeah. put it here. In the middle, sort of? Uh-huh, yes. Yeah. And you said the light goes up to the mouth, so this is not high enough? Or? This is high enough. Oh. This is high enough. It's coming like this. See? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> All right. We good? Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Told you. That's too complicated. All right, the AP and the PA. All right. This one is steel. <laughs> Can be done recumbent. It's difficult to do recumbent because have you ever tried to swallow while you're laying down? Ah, uh, yeah. It's difficult. It's and so, but, it, but sometimes you will have to do it that way. Uh, it is preferred to do it upright, but it can be done recumbent too. And if you do, just give the patient a, you know, a pillow and just tell them to do the best they can. Oh, so yes. so and it can be due and I and I said AP or PA because it's the, the, basically the same thing. Okay, you're gonna be doing the same thing, uh, the same sample array. So all right, all you gotta do just think if I'm gonna concentrate more on the uh, AP, just flip it. Okay, that is it's gonna be the same. 
All right, so place the patient supine or prone depending on what you're doing, AP or PA. Center the mid sagittal plane to the grid. Okay. Uh, turn the head slightly to facilitate the drinking of the barium. Yeah, right. <laughs> At least you're not having a drink. <laughs> At least you can turn your head. Yeah, but you turn the head. Yes, Garrett. Uh, sorry, but that's sooner. So, for the for when for the lateral and RAOs, it would it would be preferable for them to be standing up, uh, standing up, or or being. No, no, no. It's easier for the patient to do it standing, but the radiologists prefer them laying down. Oh, okay. So that's what you mean. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. So turn it up. I'll explain why uh, in, in just a second. Well, I'll just explain that. One thing is that uh, it's a little slower, and then uh, you can also see if there's any reflex. Because one stuff, anything, when I say stuff, food, in this case, barium, gets into the stomach, it should not come back out. Once it goes in, that cardiac sphincter should close. It's a closed seal, and it should, nothing should come out. If it's coming out, then you can, that's one indication. The doctor will say, ah, this patient has a reflex. And if it's reflexing barium, it's also most likely reflexing acid. Is that demonstrated through the flora, or that, are we oh, doing yeah. multiple no. exposures here, like during drinking and then after drinking? No, you can be seen after drinking. I mean, the doctor will, you, you wait, the doctor will see when the barium goes into the stomach, wait a little bit, and if the thing goes boom, back up. When I say the thing, I mean the barium, the barium goes back up. That's reflex. That's not normal. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes you even bring the patient, I told you this before, you bring the patient in Trendelenburg, and then you see, you tell the patient, bear down, bear down, and just to see if that there is, because when you bear down, a lot of times, oop, things will go back out. They shouldn't come out of the stomach again. If they do, then reflex. All right, next, uh, central ray, perpendicular to the image receptor, and at the level of T5, T6. And obviously, I have told you before, mid sagittal plane, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Say yes. Yes. Yeah. Good. The structure shown, you will see the entire esophagus filled with barium. The evaluation criteria patients' jaw not interfering with the proximal esophagus, and that's why the reason why you bring it out. Bring that uh, jaw. The esophagus through the superimposed thoracic vertebra. Okay, and the last thing is no rotation. By the way, did you guys see I, I um, on the syllabus I I changed uh, our 2014. Remember our final was I still have 2014. It's changed to 2015, no. but it's the same day. <laughs> oh, okay. I I just missed the uh, 2014. So it's Monday the 14th. I believe it is. Oh. That what it is? Yeah. Whatever I have on your syllabus, that's what it is. 2015. <clears throat> All right. So this is what we have. So you get there, you cool. It can be done? Yes, it can be done. Patient is supine, provide them a pillow, they hold the cup, they turn the head, and that's how you take the picture. Okay. okay. Uh, central ray at the level of T5, T6. Make sure you include, I will include a little bit more here. Bring it up a little more. And uh, mid-sagittal plane. 
And please, collimate. This is not good collimate. You don't need to see. This is not a chest x-ray. You're not looking for rib fractures. You're not looking for lungs. You're looking for the esophagus. So collimate to the esophagus. Okay? And this is what it should be. Uh, you probably can collimate even more. Okay? But this is fine. This is adequate. All right, take a look. You can see from the very beginning, you see barium. You might not see it completely fill here, but you see the lining of the esophagus is well shown. And then you see the esophagus all the way down into the entrance of the stomach. Okay. Yes. So you don't have to get the whole stomach on there? No, no you don't. There you go. All right, we're done with the esophagus. See, one out of the way. Up for GI coming up. Take a break, come back at 9 o'clock or 9.03.